Wow, am I glad to be back with another episode of the Box Jumper Podcast. I am your host, John St. Amand. I am a CrossFit trainer and weightlifting coach in Bedford, Nova Scotia, Canada. If you listened before, welcome back. If you're a first-timer, where the hell have you been? Before we get rolling, be sure to follow the podcast on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter with the handle at BoxJumperOver40. That's four zero. And of course, if you're listening on your favorite podcasting app, smash that subscribe button to get the next episode of the podcast automatically as it comes out. Let me start off by answering what I'm sure you're dying to know. Where the hell have I been? It's been a couple of months since my awesome double stuff, double episode chat with David Newman, CEO of RX Smart Gear. Shortly after that, we were in high gear moving towards the holidays. Things got super busy with my day job. And then to be honest, I was struggling with my motivation. It's the risk we all take, right? You take a couple of days off the gym, let a muscle tweak, settle down, let some soreness fade, whatever. And then, you know, it's time to get back into the swing of things, and somehow it's tougher than you thought, right? So that's kind of how I was thinking about the podcast. I had lots of ideas to pursue, but my motivation was a little on the fritz. Then came a flurry of tweets in early January from Pete Shaw. Like John McClain in Die Hard, stuff happens. Nobody else is stepping up, so Pete went into action. Long before January, Pete was clanging some bells already, responding to ever-changing conditions amid the pandemic. And study after study pointing to the relationship between the toughest cases of COVID-19 and chronic disease. Cancer, kidney disease, diabetes, various cardiovascular conditions, obesity, COPD, and more. The data just keep coming. Uh, And what's more, there's a considerable body of evidence that improving your fitness blunts or even reverses the impact of a number of the most prevalent chronic conditions, particularly those with relationships to lifestyle. Now, our health is a complex web of factors, including variables within and outside of our control. Some factors we can steer in the right direction more readily than others. And Pete was quick on the draw to point that out in his tweets, linking to studies that hint, if not outright say explicitly, what we should be doing about it and pointing a spotlight on conflicting messages coming from leaders of public health across the political spectrum. We've been facing down these chronic diseases for decades now, and with many of them getting worse. And now COVID-19 has made them not so much a pain in the butt to manage, but a serious threat to the lives of many in our population. What can we do about this? Why aren't we taking the necessary steps to manage it? If our physical condition is directly related to our health and our resilience against disease, particularly COVID-19, How can we convince our leaders and the general public to prioritize fitness as another arrow in our quiver to combat COVID-19? These are questions Pete has been looking to answer with his activism, trying to provoke conversation, increase awareness, inspire thoughtful debate, and influence leaders and the public to reconsider what fitness really means. That's the focus of today's episode. In 10 seconds, I'll chat with Pete Shaw, CrossFit Games athlete, co-owner of CrossFit NCR in Ottawa, Canada, CrossFit seminar staff trainer, and now health and fitness activist who's looking for anyone who will listen to be the Al Powell to his John McLean. Yippee ki Pete Shaw, welcome to the Box Jumper Podcast. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Um, we're we're going to dive into um, what's a, a fairly heavy topic um, when we get to it. But before before we start talking about what I really wanted to dig into uh, for, um, I, I'm curious. You know, I, I've I've done my level one. Obviously, I'm looking at doing my level two um, probably within this year. Um, you're part of seminar staff, so. You clearly have a deep history and knowledge of the CrossFit market space. How did you become involved in the sport? Oh man, that's a that's a loaded question. Actually, I kind of I kind of stumbled into it a little bit. Uh, I mean, I think most people that get into CrossFit, they've got some sort of uh, story where where they just sort of roll onto the CrossFit.com website, and then it's like, yeah. voila! Getting, it always seems to be by accident. Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> like nobody ever went in just knowing exactly what they yeah, wanted. I CrossFit, know, I know. I think, the door. You know, now I mean, nowadays because CrossFit's a little bit more mainstream um mm. 
you know, people know what CrossFit is often before they get into it. You know, it's in the background. Their friends do yeah. it. Their family, maybe a couple of family members do it. And it's like, ah, oh, what's this CrossFit thing? They know what the games are. And then, and then eventually they try it out. For me, um, you know, I, I grew up obviously playing sports. Um, I think, you know, back in back in sort of the, I was not necessarily early days of CrossFit, but even like I've been doing CrossFit for 10 years. Like when I started, everyone that just sort of jumped into it had a bit of a sports background and they were sort of looking for, uh, I guess, a competitive way to to stay fit. And so right. for me, I was a, a hockey player. And in the summers, I, w- I would spend the summers training in my my parents' garage gym. And my neighbor was a, a firefighter and he came over one day and he was like, hey, Pete, all the guys at the station are doing this like crazy workout. You got to you got to try it out. Here's the website. So, you know, I mm-hmm. checked out CrossFit.com, started, did my best to follow along. Uh, and, you know, the nomenclature of the workouts is a little bit confusing to anyone who doesn't uh, who doesn't know exactly what it is or hasn't been taught by a, a CrossFit trainer. Right. So you're trying to figure out, OK, like three rounds you know what's this what's front squat two dash two dash two dash (laughs) two like so you know you do your best and uh and that's you know from there i kept doing crossfit um fell into i went to university uh for biology actually so i I was i was studying something completely different i mean Mm -hmm. you know similar in some ways in terms of like you know kinesiology and you know anatomy and stuff but But uh, I became uh, a personal trainer briefly after uh, I graduated, and then I just kept using CrossFit for my clients, eventually figured out that there was CrossFit gyms in the world, <laughs> switched, <laughs> switched you know, all my clients to a, a CrossFit gym, and this is the one that, I, that I'm a co-owner of now. And then mm-hmm. I you know, became a member, an employee, and then a co-owner, and then one thing snowballed from there and now you know now i'm on seminar staff and you know i think it's just a journey of obviously constantly like obviously one falling in love with the methodology and Mm. and then two constantly trying to better better yourself right and you know when you're trying to do both those things it's it's very easy to put one foot in front of the other in the in the industry and specifically in like the crossfit world there's a lot of opportunity there yeah. I presume with, you know, the, the membership at NCR would be reflective of, of the community in, in which it's a part. Um, you know, you're not, you're not exclusively training elite athletes. You're, you're training everyday people. Um, so what, what does, what does the composition of, of your, uh, membership look like as far as, um, you know, what types of backgrounds they have, what level of athleticism they walk in the door with versus what they achieve when they, spend a little bit of time with you in the gym yeah i mean uh it's like any box nowadays it's obviously cross is becoming more popular across all demographics and so you mm-hmm. walk into most crossfit boxes now and you're going to get a wide range of of uh of people coming you know from kids to teens to you know middle-aged people we got parents we got single uh you know men and women we've got uh, grandmas and grandpas, like it, it's actually really fun to look at it now compared to when we first started. Um, you know, I've seen pictures of of our gym even before I joined. I remember when my business partners Paul and Reza, when they first opened this place up, um, you know, it was just them and a bunch of buddies lifting on like you know, laid out cardboard boxes because they didn't have the they didn't have the rubber mats in yet. And so, you know, it's just a bunch of dudes and a few, few of the competitive girls just throwing down on these cardboard boxes and everyone's, you know, uh, pretty hardcore about it. And then now, you know, it's, invo- it's evolved into this massive community where you get demographics from all over. We get, you know, people who have, um, who have had cancer and, and beat it in the in you know while they were members here we've had mm-hmm. we've got uh, now we've got an uh, we had, call it the prime timers class that we continue to run virtually and it's our sixty plus age group and um, you know some people use that class even to to as like a recovery tool if they're coming back from surgery uh, we've got our, our teens classes our kids classes like you know so it's such a wide a wide demographic. Uh, it's just it's super exciting like how how broad 
uh, or how wide a net sort of CrossFit captures uh, nowadays right. compared to what it used to be. Yeah. I have to imagine that you see a lot of the same effects uh, in your members. You know, you, you mentioned um, people getting through cancer um, while training. And, you, you know, you see the, the, the different types of ailments that people have, whether it's coming in with bad joints or they've got diabetes or, or um, they just have uh, some heart trouble or they've just got a little extra weight on them from life getting a little bit ahead of them. And, and now they're trying to, to recover from that and, and bring their health back to, um, to some semblance of, of normal so that they can, you know, use that health in their everyday life. Um, you know, mm-hmm. we certainly see it with the, the members that we interact with on a regular basis. Everybody's just pretty normal yeah. and they're, they're using their fitness. They're expressing their fitness by being out with their kids and, you know, going out skiing and going out hiking and, yeah. and going yeah. for swims and walking. And so all of these different areas. And so the, the time in the gym is to enrich their life outside the gym. That's exactly um, it. Yeah. Even though they really love their time in the gym as well. Yeah. No, uh, it, that community aspect really is a, a big part of it. Yeah. It's, you know, it's funny. It's funny. You talked about that. Like, uh, you know, I, I used to, I grew up doing all kinds of sports. Like I, I was, you know, just, just alluding to there and, and now my sport is CrossFit, you know? So for the past probably, you know, seven, the better part of seven years, uh, I've lived, breathed, eat CrossFit, like everything is CrossFit. Um, and, you know, I train CrossFit to be better at CrossFit. But, you know, more recently, you know, I'm looking at my 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 sort of career and, you know, obviously this year I'm going to try to go back to the CrossFit games and I'm going to I'm going to try to prolong my my CrossFit career as, as best I can. But, uh, right. you know, just getting outside a little bit more with the lockdown and everything with this pandemic. Like I've been, I've been looking forward to uh, like using my fitness outside the gym a little bit more often. Like, you know, this is the first year that I tried cross country skiing, you know, and I'm like, oh, okay, like this is really fun. Yeah. It'd be great to go cross country skiing. And, you know, I was in years past, I've tried to get into you know, like jujitsu a little bit. And, um, and uh, now, you know, I've got some some friends who I just figured out like that they, you know, they competed in jujitsu for like 10 years. And I'm like, so I'm getting excited about maybe trying that. And, you know, now I've got a kid too. So there's, you know, there's applying your fitness to, to you know, being a dad. And so, yeah. you know, looking, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to sort of that stage of my, my CrossFit career, I guess you could say. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but it's exciting to it's exciting to see all the different ways that that people in the gym are, are using it, you know, using their fitness in different ways. Yeah, and and the pandemic certainly has brought, um, uh, you know, opened people's eyes anyway to uh, different ways that they can use their fitness outside the gym. When in a lot of cases across the country and and throughout the rest of the world, uh, gyms have been closed, open, closed again. Um, and mm-hmm. so, you know, they're, the, the, the gyms are finding ways to encourage members to stick around the community, whether it's doing workouts online, but also sending people out to do challenges outside. Yeah. Um, I wound up taking up snowboarding for the first time oh, nice. uh, ever, uh, right as the pandemic was starting. So the ski hill stayed open for about a week yep. after, after I bought, uh, my pass, uh, fortunately it still counts for this year, but I just haven't managed to get out there yet. Man, so um, picking up snowboarding for the first time, man, that's, uh, you're asking for a, a bruised ass for a few oh, weeks. Oh yeah. There. <laughs> I mean, there's no way that I could have been prepared for that without CrossFit too. Uh, not at my age anyway. If I was younger, it'd be a little bit different story. You're rubber when you're younger. Yeah. Um, but at 45, every fall hurts no matter how good and uh, how good you are, no matter how in shape you are, you're feeling it for a couple of days that's after you fall. Exactly. Um, and you know, the first time I took, the first time I went skiing was, uh, two years before that. And my legs were sore for two days, oh my despite, God. despite the fact that, you know, I, I can squat heavy and I can yep. squat, I can squat a moderate weight for a long period of time, but geez, yep. does that ever hit muscles that you didn't know were in there? Dude, it's funny. Like I, like I grew up, I grew up skiing, so I played hockey and then, you know, even towards, but I also skied, we were a skiing family and, and, yep. uh, and then later in, in in like high school, I would alternate winters skiing versus playing hockey. And 
you know, so I did it pretty often. And even still now the first, like the first week of going to the ski hill or even the first like two or three times you go my your quads are absolutely shot just like what you said like j- you did it for the first time it's no different if you're 10 years into skiing the, the <laughs> first the first one of the season is always the worst and it's just like well it's because you're basically you're you're almost bent at like 45 degrees to 90 degrees oh like, yeah you know, yeah, you're in like a quarter to a half squat yeah, yeah, for yeah. an extended period of time. Yeah, exactly. Like just take the next like three hours and and then do, uh, you know, like every every 10 minutes, do like a five minute wall set and you're good. And that's that's I, what skiing is. I'm surprised people aren't bringing foam rollers to the hill. Yeah, no, it's exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's, a, it's certainly a different experience taking on a new sport, uh, especially later in life. I'm embarrassed that I didn't wind up trying skiing and snowboarding much, much earlier. I mean, I certainly had the opportunities. We've got mm-hmm. a couple of ski hills within an hour drive of Halifax. Mm-hmm. And, you know, all the way through junior high and high school, there were uh, ski trips through the winter that, that people would go on in the middle of the week. And I just never decided to try it. I just, mm-hmm. I wasn't, I don't know. I just, it, for whatever right reason, it just didn't resonate with me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not a hockey player either. I did other sports. Um, so once I finally got on the hill, I, I asked myself, why the hell didn't I do this a long time ago? It, yeah. it seems weird, but you know, I'd rather learn the new sport while I still can than, totally. you know, try to take it up long after I, I really am not capable of doing it anymore. Yeah. And you know, and you know, what's funny. I think that, uh, I think that's one thing about CrossFit. That's, that people don't sort of identify enough is the confidence that it gives you to do those new things. Like yeah, you know, the, the fitter, the fitter and stronger you get, the more confidence you have to go out and try these, maybe whether it's a new sport or, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's, maybe you never go hiking because you're just like, yeah. oh, I don't Even know. It's just doing something different around the house that you've not done previously. Yeah, it it yeah. gives you, it gives you a competence in moving through space. Yep. You just get a better awareness of what your body's capable of, how you can move, how you can move safely. Totally. And so when you when you talk to people about, well, why do you do CrossFit? And you say, well, you know, I, I want to be able to pick up my wet load of laundry, uh, you know, when I'm older and not have it hurt my back. And they're yep. like, well, what the hell does lifting a barbell have to do with lifting a load of laundry? Exactly. Sit down. Let me tell you a story. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly it, right. yeah. No. So how has, how has the pandemic hit your gym? Um, we've been incredibly lucky in Nova Scotia. We, through some weird confluence of incredibly good luck, low exposure rates to begin with. Yes, we have an international airport, but we don't see a huge influx of people coming in and staying in Halifax the same way as Ontario Mm -hmm. or or Quebec would. Mm -hmm. So we got exceptionally lucky in addition to good public policy, shutting everything down very abruptly for an extended period of time. Yeah, you guys were in that bubble for a while, right? A lot of that. Yeah. And I mean, some of that had to do with those other provinces had kind of similar circumstances. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we were able to kind of say, all right, well, we can travel within these neighboring provinces and not really radically change things. We still had some shutdowns for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, my, my home gym was closed for, um, well, really from March all the way through to the, I'm trying to remember if it was the beginning or the end of June. Um, so that was challenging. Um, what kind of closure period did you have? Up uh, yeah, it's been, I mean, it's been on and off the, the, the biggest one was the first lockdown that was, yep. uh, last spring. And, um, Oh man, I forget how many months that went on for. Was it like four months, something like that? It's all a blur at this point, to be honest. But Probably something similar because yeah. I remember when we were opening up, the rest of the country was talking about opening up in around the same time frame. Yeah. I don't think anybody really got to it a whole lot earlier or a whole lot later. Yeah, so yeah, it was around that period of time, about four months, and um, and I mean, we've been we've been lucky. I like to I like to keep some perspective on it. Obviously, it sucks that the gym you know, is shut down. We don't get to provide the same level of, uh, fitness programming for the community as we do on any, on any given day, on a normal day, not no pandemic. Right. Um, you know, it's not as convenient for people. It, it throws everyone's routine off, not being able to come into the gym. You don't get the in-person training. However, and that's in addition to their usual routine itself already being disrupted as no, well. No, exactly. Like that, that was one major thing. And, you know, we can 
talk a little bit about that after but man like that was a huge huge disruptor in that especially that first wave i feel i think by now people have almost gotten into the routine of having their routine disrupted if you can mm, yeah. you know so to speak but um so you know me for me I, I know i'm handling this lockdown a lot better than i did the first one personally mm. but uh in terms of the gym you know, in Canada and Ontario, we've been lucky with all the the government support, like financial support that we've been we've been getting. And and uh, mm-hmm. you know, for us, you know, we we lost a significant portion of revenue, but uh, in the first shutdown. But the you know the federal government with their subsidies, we were able to to keep going, and they they significantly. Uh, helped us out and you know the Ontario government was helping with rent relief and all kinds of stuff so um, we've been blessed up here Uh, I always like to you know obviously it's hard not to compare to what's going on in the United States just because they're our neighbors but you know I I hear stories about what's going on in the states and there's a lot of there's so many gyms that just aren't getting the the relief that they need financially and so many businesses going under and so many gyms going under and it's it's really sad to see so you know i count count our lucky stars just a a little bit you know whenever i get frustrated with the situation i'm like okay you know it could be a lot worse um Mm. uh you know despite that obviously uh, you know we still want to abdicate for for health and fitness because it's a it's a really important part of of uh, the community and and keeping uh, healthcare costs down and keeping uh, keeping everyone in, you know, in our communities, whether it's, you know, locally or, or nationally keeping everyone healthy. So we want to advocate for that, but at the same time, we just want to, you know, make sure that we're keeping everything in perspective and, um, yeah, you know, and at this point too, so, you know, we went through the first lockdown, uh, we were open for the summer, uh, towards the end of the summer there was another a second lockdown and we but luckily it was nice enough weather so we actually just we went instead of virtual classes which we did the first lockdown we took our entire uh our entire business online Mm -hmm. that was a a steep learning curve and then we came back in uh like we rented all our equipment out to everybody and then on the second lockdown we we took our classes to the parking lot so we're like okay the restrictions were a little bit different and there was, you know, there were restrictions on gathering sizes outdoors. So we were like, okay, well we can manage this. And we did that all the way until, uh, who it was all of October. So towards the end of October, we actually had, you know, 6am it was snowing out and, you know, people are doing <laughs> thrusters in the parking lot. You know, some of the coldest, it was really funny. We've had a mild winter. Some of the coldest days I've experienced were actually in late October when we ran our outdoor classes. And yeah, it's been uh, like that here too. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. And, um, you know, after that, we got to go back inside again. And then now, mm-hmm. you know, now we're in the third sort of major, uh, province-wide shutdown. Uh, mm-hmm. We're coming. I I feel like we're coming towards the tail end of it. Toronto, the t- Greater Toronto area, has been shut down since October. We got mm-hmm. to, in Ottawa here. We got to open back up at the end of October, and then now we've been we've been shut down again. And sort of on and off in Ontario. Uh, more now, some of the more rural areas are who which have much less cases are starting to reopen their schools. Um, mm-hmm. So you know you can sort of feel like we're like there is light at the end of the tunnel. But um, you know we took a lot from from that first lockdown and, and we learned a lot about running that virtual business. So now we're a little bit more relaxed about about how we are going about taking our business online and, and providing as much service to our members as possible. So, you know, we're, we're not completely out of the weeds, but we, you know, mm. we're doing well as a gym. We're, you know, we're going to be okay. We're going to come out on the other side of this. And, you know, I'm very thankful for that. Um, yeah. So that's, you know, it's kind of where we're at. I know certainly the, the experience that I've had, um, with the, the two gyms that I've been a member of in the last year, the, the, um, the uncertainty has certainly been a, a major factor. Mm-hmm. Um, part of it is not knowing when shutdowns would come to an end and when things would resume some normalcy. But the, the greater piece of that uncertainty seems to have come from uh, public policy shifting as time went on, whether that was with uh, deeper knowledge uh, of the 
the virus and how it spreads yeah. or whether it's through uh, just fear and perception of spread of the virus because that's you know it's a double edged sword the the more you know the more it uh, can potentially drive a wedge in people's views on how best to handle it for sure um, you know we've seen businesses of different types treated differently yep um, so you know the the walmarts of the world the, the the big box stores now there's a reason for some of that one is you know they, they're places where you get groceries etc but they also yep. have a square footprint uh, that allows a degree of distancing that little ma and pa shops are sure. find very, very difficult. And For the same sure. is true of CrossFit gyms. Yeah. The, the gyms that are larger with a much more significant square footage, yeah. when they start saying, well, you have to be able to stay 10 feet away from the person working out next to you, yeah. um, you know, there's certain gyms that are able to do that quite handily. Yeah. And other gyms have a real hard time being able to accommodate those spacing requirements, totally. um, whether, whether they're able to adhere to other um, specific COVID requirements or not. Mm -hmm. What have, what have some of the COVID requirements, uh, that have been imposed in Ontario looked like? Um, and, and have they shifted over time? Uh, yeah, they shifted a little bit. Uh, nothing crazy though. Uh, so at the beginning it was just sort of the standard, the standard COVID safety protocols, uh, needed to be implemented in, in the gym setting, um, in terms of social distancing and mask wearing indoors, and uh, screening so, questions before people arrive. And that's right. Those, Screen, those that's right. Screening, exactly. There was yeah. actually no, uh, there's no requirement for, let's say like they didn't make it mandatory for gyms to have, um, like sign in for the class before and really? after. like that. Yeah. Okay. Like there was, it was really interesting. Like there was a lot of stuff that we could be doing extra, um, which was part of the part of some of my frustrations because I felt like, you know, they put these sort of very soft rules about COVID safety in the gym environment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not surprisingly, some gyms went over and above and some didn't. And then, you know, when they go ahead and they shut gyms down, from my perspective, I want to say something like, okay, well, we've got an opportunity here to increase COVID safety. Um, mm -hmm. And you you haven't put that in the rule book yet. So yeah. why don't we try it out, see how it goes. And then, you know, if we're at the maximum <laughs> level of COVID safety, then you can, you know, then you can feel good about shutting us down if there's still, you know, spread or something like that. Right. But some of the stuff was just standard, you know, social distancing. Um, and then they... And then after the after the first uh, sorry no they, after the second shutdown in October when we came back they actually modified slightly they increased the distance between uh, people inside the gym working out from right. uh, I believe it was from two meters to three meters yeah that's what we did here yeah too. so we had to do that uh, but it's still the mask wearing it was still the same like you came into the gym you had to wear your mask while you were indoors but you didn't have to wear your mask while you were working out. Right. Um, and, and then we, you had to maintain, you know, obviously, uh, you know, cleanliness on, on the surfaces of the gym, uh, yeah. and all that. So, so regular cleaning, et cetera, you had to have hand sanitizer available and all this stuff. Um, so it's just sort of the standard <clears throat> stuff that you, you hear from public health, just sort of like everywhere. Right. And nothing right. crazy specific to the gym environment. I feel like mm. there could have been, there could be a little bit more you know, going into that. Um, yeah, it's funny that in, like in certain industries, um, certainly in Nova Scotia, in certain industries got very specific requirements. Yeah. So things like uh, massage therapy or hair care, yep. um, certainly the restaurants uh, had very, very stringent requirements and they, they've probably suffered the worst from the ebb and flow of what the requirements have been. Mm -hmm. um, my my neighbor owns one of the Montana's restaurants here, mm -hmm. and um, you know I, I I've bounced some ideas back and forth with her, and and the requirements at the um, at the restaurant level have been fluctuating quite a bit in terms of their allowable capacity, and um, you know having to move exclusively to uh, pick up and delivery for right. large chunks of time, and then when they were allowed to open back up. Um, similar things that the gyms experience where everybody had to be a certain distance apart and yeah. people sitting at the same table had to be part of the same bubble. And, and so, you know, the, and those have all been moving parts, um, that have been 
difficult. But I think one of the things that I noticed uh, in particular is that for several of these industries that were um, that were moving almost in lockstep with one another, they all have industry associations um, yeah. that are advocating for them. In fact, so, in some cases, the industry association came out saying what they wanted for public policy before public policy actually announced the change. Right. So the restaurant industry association said, you know, right now you've got us uh, at such a low capacity threshold, we'd rather be shut down and apply for federal aid than be open because no one is going to come to the restaurants. We can't seat enough people to be profitable, not mm-hmm. with the square footage that we have. Right. So that's what the industry association argued for. And that's what wound up happening it, there. I, I'm not aware of, I mean, certainly in Nova Scotia up until very, very recently, as a result of the pandemic, a, uh, a gym owners association has been set up in Nova Scotia. It's still in its infant stage at the moment. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering if there's something similar in Ontario and, and, is that potentially part of the route to getting a little bit more of a common standard applied in fitness businesses when the pandemic is concerned? Yeah, there's definitely, uh, that could potentially be a means to an end. Uh, it tends, so the, you know, the policymakers tend to listen to large groups uh, of you know, stakeholders in, in these industries and, and the benefit of having these, uh, these advocacy groups is Mm -hmm. that, you know, they tend to come to the table representing a large group. And, and for the most part, from what I've seen, um, just sort of going through this advocacy effort myself is that there is sort of a more or less a spotty at best, you know, sort of broken up different small efforts across, across the country, uh, Mm -hmm. really, um, within each, each province. Now there's, you know, there are pockets of small, you know, I mean, relatively small, but like you said, you know, there's groups of gym owners in different provinces starting to get together and and try to, you know, get a collective push towards, uh, a common goal. Um, one group that I have actually been in touch with recently is the, the FIC, the fitness industry council of Canada, which, you know, this is a a new, uh, group. Uh, in, in, you know, to my knowledge, uh, but they were started by, they were f- founded by good life in 2008. And what mm-hmm. I've, what I've learned is that across the country, they've uh, been in communication with, uh, some of the policymakers in, in different provinces. They have been, haven't been very successful with communication, um, with the provincial government in Ontario, but, uh, and in different provinces, for example, BC, I know that they've had a spot at the table and they've advocated for for different things like and that has to do with, you know, uh, differences between different types of exercises, uh, different types of um, fitness classes, group classes versus individual versus high intensity, uh, yeah. stuff like that. So, you know, there it, those those groups do exist. Um, but you got to understand, too, is that I was talking uh, about this with someone the other day is we have a very young industry like the fitness industry hasn't been around for very long compared to mm. you know let's say restaurants right <laughs> like true yeah um you know when the industry really exploded in like the 70s and so it's a very young industry compared to a lot of these these other industries that have you know they've uh, sort of established themselves with these advocacy groups because they've they've gone through all of all of the the policy issues uh and they've had to work through them over time and you know the fitness industry is is young, and this is a huge hurdle for every single industry in the entire world. And oh, yeah. so, you know, and so now it's sort of, I, I think the the first time where the fitness industry sort of had to come together as like a collective group um, to try to to try to achieve a common goal. But, and um, I mean, unfortunately, it's a pandemic and. At the same time, you've got all these other groups that are fighting for similar things. So sometimes it gets easily lost and in, in, in the noise. But um, yeah, it's it's kind of interesting to see sort of how it's all unfolded and 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 how all these uh, these groups are either sort of lacking cohesiveness or there is a bit of cohesiveness in certain provinces and people are just trying to figure it out. Yeah, and I mean, some of it comes down to scale too. I mean, in Nova Scotia, um, there there's. You know, I mean, there, there's a well-established fitness business uh, industry here, but the numbers um, here make it 
probably a little bit easier for everybody to get together than it would be in a really densely populated area like Ontario. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, like the, the CrossFit gyms themselves, um, yeah. you know, sub sub segmenting that really structured fitness class environment that all, even if they're not a CrossFit gym, but they operate in kind of a similar fashion, you know, a limited number of people within uh, a group class environment. And so there's, almost automatically a certain number of, um, square feet between each person that's in the gym at any given time versus the globo gyms where that has not traditionally been their model. And they're having to shoehorn themselves into that kind of environment. It's, it's gotta be very difficult for everybody to see things the same way and agree upon a common direction. Um, let alone common points for advocacy, um, to government officials. No, for sure. That's, that's, it's, that's definitely, you're totally right there. But I think that, I mean, you don't need to, in terms of the COVID protocols, right? I think we could, I think there's a, there's a place that we can, you can get to agreement based on like what is safe and what is not safe. Right. And especially yeah. uh, with all the evidence. Right. And I mean, especially when more time goes on too. Yeah, I mean, exactly. we're, we're now what, 10 months into this, nine months into this. So that's right. We, we've got data available to us today that we totally. didn't have back in March. Totally. And even if you're, if you're a global gym, if you're a global gym versus, you know, a smaller community gym, like a CrossFit gym running group classes and there's coaching in the class from start to finish. I mean, in terms of the COVID protocols themselves, like you can come to a, a place where, you know, everyone that still goes into a global style gym needs to check in at some point. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, so you can, you can keep tabs on your, your traffic in and out of the, of the building, no matter what style of gym you are there. Um, you know, you can put markings on the ground, right in every situation you yep. can you, you know for the most part the equipment is uh is portable right so you can you can move it around it's not like yeah there's some pieces of equipment maybe in a global gym that are a little heavier uh to mm. move around and such but you know you can establish rules where you know you you uh you have to stay in like a certain area or and whatnot and in this area you have you know access to to xyz amounts of equipment and you know i'm just thinking in in our gym um or in in alberta for example in alberta at one point they they you weren't allowed group classes so you you couldn't Mm -hmm. they, they modified their rules from allowing group classes to not allowing group classes it's like okay well but you can, but you can go in. You can reserve a space in a gym, and you can conduct your exercise on your own terms. Yeah. Okay. So interpreted in from the perspective of a CrossFit gym, you're just not going to have coaching. So you could get someone who's just going to register themselves for like an hour time slot in your class or in your gym. They're going to walk in. They're going to use the equipment in their in their square or their socially distance area, and then they're going to wipe it all down and they're going to leave. You know whether they're getting coached or they're not to me that's you can easily recreate that in pretty much any gym environment right yeah so i think there's like in terms of what is safe and what is not with the covid stuff it's pretty it's it's very clear sort of what direction you need to head and i think that becomes sort of the common ground between these types of gyms right you can you can always find um you can use those those safety protocols to find that common ground and say like okay like yes we know that there might be a, a best way to run a, a certain type of, of gym business, but in terms of what is safe uh, COVID wise or not, these are sort of the well-established uh, like foundations of COVID safety. And mm-hmm. this is what we should probably like implement in all these gym environments. Where, where do you figure that the, the, the uh, public health officials will get this guidance so that they can establish from the top down what that minimum requirement is to manage uh, COVID safety? You mean in terms of the gyms or like where are they getting it in general? Well, I mean, like where, where would they, go, uh, who would they turn to in order to have a partner to establish what those uh, parameters are that would allow the gyms to have buy-in to what they're saying? I mean, they, it, it right. can't be that the government is simply going to say, well, we all put our heads together. None of us are gym goers, but here's what you're going to be asked to do. Right. Um, you know, how do we, uh, how do they establish what those parameters should be in a way that the gyms can 
get behind and support, not just for the 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 self interest of being able to stay open, but yeah. for the the common interest of being able to continue to make progress in people's health and fitness in a safe fashion amid the pandemic. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of what I've been fighting for, right. Is to try to get, right. is to try to get a seat at the table to, to, um, to educate these policymakers on what it is exactly that we do. Like it, it's, it, you're right. It's a big industry. There's a lot of different types of gyms. Um, and you know, if, if only the big box global gyms are, are getting a say in, what the protocols are, mm. um, then maybe then maybe these policymakers aren't seeing the whole story, right? And so, right. so the goal is to is to have them listen to all the stakeholders or all potential stakeholders, different people from from slightly different types of gyms, and you know how they how they run, um, so that we can educate them on what is what's possible you know what's possible in the gym environment what what uh what can we and can we not do in terms of the covid safety protocols and and then just sort of move forward from there and that's sort of that's what i've been you know pushing for from the very start is just a conversation right, right. um because it didn't really seem like that conversation is happening <clears throat> um it you know for example you, for example the mask thing it's a simple it's a very simple um, solution to increase COVID safety would be just to wear a mask while you're working out, right? There's a lot, yep. of, there's a lot of states uh, that are doing that right now. Um, and in Ontario, we were only ever forced to wear the mask inside and then we were allowed to take it off uh, while we were working out. Well, it seems to me like it's just sort of an easy step in the direction of increased safety is to just, you know, Okay, well, we are, you know, to say, okay, we're at this many cases, uh, everyone doing exercise has to wear their mask, right? Yeah, um, yeah. You know, and then there's there's a lot of examples like that, that that can just be sort of dialed up or dialed down depending on on the current situation. And it, so it just didn't really make sense to me that that the conversations happening uh, at these, these tables were, um, well, there, it just didn't seem like there was someone who was in the know on the other side of the table, right? Yeah, and and it seems like some of those same, arguably some parallels can be drawn with um, personal care services um, because those are similarly um, in-person services that are delivered in an environment where you could argue that it's easier to do without a mask on than off, but Mm -hmm. it can be done with a mask on. For sure. I mean, the only exception to that, that in any way, shape, or form it would be considered reasonable would be dining in a restaurant. Mm-hmm. You clearly can't eat with a mask on. Yep. Um, th- that's the only circumstance where you can argue that you simply can't do it in yep. every other circumstance. Why wouldn't it be considered at least on the table? I mean, personally, I don't want to do Fran while wearing a mask. Yeah. So if exactly. that means I don't have to do Fran until yep. the end of the pandemic, that's a sacrifice <laughs> I am perfectly willing to make. I think most people would say the same thing. <laughs> yeah. But, but in the grand scheme of things, if it made the difference b- between my affiliate being open or being closed, mm-hmm. if it made the difference between my having to work out in, well, I mean, my my garage is a bad example. I have a full CrossFit gym, but if I was working out in my basement mm-hmm. uh, and and on Zoom with body weight only, or God forbid, a pair of dumbbells or something, mm-hmm. versus being allowed in the gym and I had to wear a mask even during the workout, I yeah. take the latter. I, I would not want to be limited to the Zoom class thing. For sure, for somebody for somebody that has, um, you know, either a. a, a uh, if they're immunocompromised or, or there's some other compelling reason where being home and not being in the gym environment is still statistically speaking safer than being in the gym, whether they have a mask on or not yeah. fine. Yeah. But it's interesting that that wasn't an option that was put onto the table for the gym industry, yeah. but it was put on the table for people doing hair care. At, uh, at, well, at one point, and, and this might be the case now in BC, but I know at, at one point in BC, like they've done, they've been done a pretty good job of um, like BC still isn't a mandatory ma- mask wearing indoors in a lot of places. And, and they've been, you know, hmm. despite some of these differences in COVID protocols, like they've been doing pretty damn well. Like, yeah, they've had, a, you know, the normal sort of ups and downs, of the waves, but um, yeah. They uh, they haven't had like outstanding spikes in in hospitalizations and deaths and and 
you know, they're not mandating that mask work. So what is that telling you? Okay, well, they're managing it at the at a micro level just a little bit better. And one of the things that they did at one point was um, they allowed they allowed gyms to stay open, but they couldn't do high intensity exercise. So I know, you know, I know a gym uh, on uh, in Victoria that they had just done for that month. They just put everyone on like a strength cycle. It's like, okay, so everyone goes into the gym and, you know, they're going to do back squat, bench and, and deadlift heavy for a month. Everyone's going to get stronger and, you know, they're going to stay fit in the meantime. But, you know, like you said, they're not doing Fran. Um, but so I don't think anyone's complaining, but they can go in, keep their routine. The gym still, uh, still gets to stay open. Um, you know, they still get to make that revenue and, you know, maybe that gym doesn't even at that point have to, um, have to dip into the, the, uh, financial aid that the fed federal government is sort of putting out. Right. So, Mm. you know, it, it comes back to as well as, Yes, it's amazing that we're getting all this financial aid and we're going to be able to stay open from it. But on the grand scheme of things, if absolutely every every small business in the entire country needs to dip into this financial aid, okay, well, what's our economy, economic yeah. situation or our debt situation going to look like after this thing? It's going to be, you know, so there's a there's a balance. There's there's pros and cons to both scenarios. And for sure, if you can balance it and you can keep some of these businesses open for a period of time, then uh, then everyone's going to going to benefit economically and then you can also keep keep things safe one of the principal challenges that i've seen um at least anecdotally is is media coverage with you know when they when they ask the public well what what businesses should be allowed open what do you think Mm. and commonly one of the arguments um is you know what what's essential versus not Mm -hmm. and um you know, I mean, depending on what camp you fall into, there, there's a variety of different perspectives on that. But, yeah. um, you know, when it comes to gyms, the 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 questions always seem coached in sort of a um, – in some cases, it's veiled. In some cases, it's right in your face. The idea that a gym is a luxury that we can do without. Right. Um, and so that's the reason that gyms are one of the first things to go when – um, when things need to be pulled back and, and couple that with the assumption for the moment that they're entering this idea, um, or, or entering with the idea that gyms can't perform, uh, what they do with everyone wearing a mask for the duration of their service, which we've just discussed is ridiculous. It can still be done. It can, yeah. So if, if we put that back on the table and we say, this stuff can be done with a mask on. Why are we treating gyms like they are a luxury that can afford to shut down? Mm-hmm. Um, and and there, there's not a lot of discussion about the the downstream effect of mm-hmm. people looking after their health and mm-hmm. regular gym going, and in particular structured gym going, yeah. um, having a significant impact on that person's health outside of what it might mean to covid itself but just when you look at um, people's mental well-being their physical well-being what it means to the the rest of their life kind of like we talked about at the beginning mm-hmm. all the impacts that physical fitness and health have on their ability to just live yeah then you start sprinkling on top of that the additional layer with you know sort of your insurance brain on yeah um you know we're, we're talking about in canada in particular a single payer system where the government is on the hook for our health care so yeah. wouldn't they want to keep health care costs reasonable and they've been spiraling up and up and up for decades and we're yeah. not really getting at the root cause yeah. with because we're afraid to look at the fact that we are all well the majority of people anyway are deconditioned because we no longer work in the fields. We no longer have physical uh, jobs. The vast majority of people eat processed foods on a regular basis. And so we're making ourselves unhealthy right out of the gate. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the idea that gym going is a luxury. uh, I, I think we're missing an opportunity to get people healthy so that they're not driving the cost of healthcare up. For sure. And, you know, like, you, you, you hit the nail on the head there with in terms of, uh, you know, why we need to, as a fitness, as a fitness industry, sort of take advantage of this, this pandemic as almost a catalyst to, uh, to bring a magnifying glass onto this, this situation. Uh, that you, it, yeah, I it really could be an education just, moment. Right, yeah, thing. it's like when yeah. you just outlined like a massive problem. Uh, that's been lingering for like a long, long time, you know, like in Canada, 
over 70% of our healthcare costs are going towards uh, treating chronic diseases, you know, yeah. and in large part, a lot of those chronic diseases are, are lifestyle associated and, and can be improved or potentially even cured with a, with a lifestyle change, eating uh, nutritious food and, and starting to exercise. Um, yeah. I mean, it's not like, it's not like we haven't realized that right they, in the, the Canadian Medical Association guidelines, a lot of these chronic diseases, the first line of treatment is recommending exercise and eating healthier foods. So, you know, the part of the, there's a massive, massive issue that I think has been at the forefront of uh, in the CrossFit world for a long time. Um, mm. You know, the CrossFit, we talk about it at the level one. Like I, I you know, I just, yeah. I just quoted that stat from, uh, the nutrition lecture at our CrossFit level one trainer course. And, um, so it's been, it's been an issue for a long time. And this pandemic has just, has just been a bit of a catalyst that we can, we can sort of look at and say, Oh my God, this, this thing is, is getting out of control because it's the data shows the more we go along in this pandemic, those who are, um, those who have these comorbidities are more susceptible to uh, a severe COVID outcome. And, yeah. and if you're increasing your fitness, then you're going to be actually less likely to suffer a severe COVID infection. And there's right. actually a, there's actually a paper that just got released recently from uh, Mayo clinic proceedings. Um, and I think it was actually published uh, or is it, it was accepted like in October last year, but they just published it uh, this January and uh, it, it was the first paper to actually directly link an increase in fitness to improved COVID outcomes, um, which is super significant. I mean, for us, right, in, in the fitness oh, industry, yeah. that's huge because it, it, it tells you that the things that we do are essential in, this pan, in, the, in the context of this pandemic. Right. If you if you yeah. want to improve your outcomes, if you have to in terms of hospitalization numbers and even deaths, you need to improve your health and you you can improve your health through increasing your fitness and by eat by eating uh, by exercise and eating uh, more nutritious food. Um, but it's yeah, like, you know, that's a, it's, it's such a massive problem. It's such a massive problem. And it's it. But you know, like you said, we could use this, we can use the pandemic to try to to try to steer the ship in the right direction because of these these you know by definition these chronic diseases are, are slow they're slow moving they're happening over this large period of time and and they're slow creeping and I, that's part of the reason why no one pays attention to them and well now, and yeah and and the other the comorbidities don't face everyone the same way at the same time unlike the pandemic where it's a barrel of a gun that we are all staring down at the same time yeah yeah. So it it does present a unique moment of clarity for people to realize that hey that you know the this particular virus and the disease that it causes is something that could hit absolutely any one of us. Yep. Yes, the effect may be different on each one of us depending on the other factors that go into this thing, but mm-hmm. we are all susceptible to it to one degree or another. Mm-hmm. And if that is the unifying bit of information that allows people to to really kind of crisp, have that crystallized moment and yeah. start looking at um, fitness as a hedge against yeah. a variety of ailments. COVID is just the tip of the iceberg, really. I mean, this kind of thing can happen in the future too. Yeah. Yeah. In addition to the comorbidities that um, we humans already face because of our lifestyle choices. So, you know, my hope is that this is what it takes to get the the healthcare um, industry and mm. the people that make policy decisions, particularly when we talk about the payers, whether that's government in the case of single payer environments like Canada and, and the UK, or insurance providers in the states, we've already seen some of them take baby steps towards mm-hmm. rewarding fitness. For you know, sure. the, the, there, there were a couple of insurance companies. I can't remember for life of me which ones they were. Yep. But you know, you, you had to have a particular model of Fitbit. And, right. you know, the, the, and the same way they give you rewards for having a, a tracker in your car so that they can see that you drive safely. Yeah. You know, they're, they're rewarding good behavior. Exactly. And they're doing that in uh, Canada, actually. I'm, I'm, I, my life insurance company rewards me with uh, rebates on my insurance policy if I, if I stay fit. 
Oh, I really got to look into yeah, that. So Manulife. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, no, they're, they're starting everywhere. And like, just to like, just to go back for a second on the, on the conversation about like, what is an essential business and what isn't an essential business? Like mm. it's such a, I mean, you know, you can, you can make arguments on where we're going to place businesses on this, this sliding scale of what is essential. Right. And, uh, you know, some things are more or less essential. Like you need, obviously you need to get gas for your car, right? So you got right. to conduct any sort of activity. Uh, you, you need to be able to, to drive your car around. So, you know, there's that level of essential and then, you know, and then there's the level of essential for, uh, that, um, physiotherapists fall under right which at one point they they were i believe they were shut down at one point and they were back open and for the most part in ontario they've been open but the physiotherapists um you know they conduct their business very similarly to a a personal training center um or you know if we were going to do one-on-one crossfit training where you know there's Obviously, there's the manual therapy stuff for the a lot of the acute injuries, but then there's sort of the prehab rehab type stuff that goes on in you know 50 percent of of the clients where right. you know and then so it's like so that argument can be made. Can you do that virtually? You know, maybe, maybe not. Um, so you know, and then shortly after that, the the fitness business sort of in my eyes sort of slides in, and and at one point because of everything that we've just talked about, that would be, you know, that would qualify in my eyes as an essential business. But, you know, obviously we can, we're, we're surviving with the virtual, uh, the virtual strategy, trying to get people to work out in their homes. What frustrates me the most and sort of what was, what caused me to sort of go down this road a year ago was in the first wave, it's, it, there was such a lack of acknowledgement that from the, from the government and from the, the, um, from the in the communication from the the government and public health to the public about how to stay safe from COVID and how to stay and in the factors that health was a part of that, like they yeah. were there was the obvious ones like they're preaching wearing masks, uh, you know, social distancing, hand washing, washing hands, and, yeah. and I was so and I'm so on board with all those things. Like it's it, you need to be doing those things, right? And then, yeah. but then at a certain point, it's you start to ask yourself, okay, what are the other things that we can control? Okay, all this data is coming out that if you are um, if you are unhealthy, then you could you could risk a severe COVID infection. Why isn't anyone talking about this publicly? It just seems yeah. it makes it makes too much sense to me that someone should be talking about this, like. Teresa Tam, uh, you know, the public health officer of the entire nation, like yeah. she did say at one point, actually, I give her kudos, like going into the, the Christmas season, she did say publicly at one point that people should consider dialing down their alcohol intake, which would which would really help the health aspect. Mm-hmm. But why, why, don't we, why aren't we taking this stuff further? Why aren't we saying to people, um, you know, it, it takes more than maybe just a walk around the block outside. Like maybe we should be helping some of these small businesses, these community gyms who are putting on, they're busting their ass trying to put on these amazing virtual programs uh, to keep people healthy from the safety of their own homes. Mm. It would be really cool if if the Ontario government, other governments across Canada um, started to promote these programs, right? Like there's, there's so many opportunities, missed opportunities in my mind. And, you know, the the good that you and I are hoping for that will come out of this pandemic, this sort of realization uh, that there needs to be a premium put on our health. For me, it starts with uh, that recognition, that acknowledgement that it is a problem. And to me, there hasn't been that acknowledgement yet. So, you know, regardless of, yeah. you know, whether or not we stay open or we close, like, you know, I am, I am game for, trying to weather the storm in terms of our business uh, as long as there's sort of uh, an acknowledgement of the data and, and a realistic approach to the whole thing. And for me, I'm obviously biased, but we're both biased because we're, you know, we're, uh, yeah. we're, we're gym goers, but, um, but uh, the data speaks the truth, right? Like you look at, you look at the the numbers that are coming out and it seems to be, it seems to be too obvious. And that's sort of where the frustration stem from is, is like, we're just not hearing that acknowledgement from, from anyone who's speaking in the public eye. 
Yeah, I mean, even in in Nova Scotia, Doctor Strang, the chief public officer, uh, chief public health officer here in Nova Scotia, um, he's been good about it. He hasn't. Um, he hasn't. Uh, he's given somewhat mixed messages to the public. I mean, he did talk about staying physically active being important, but then, you know, uh, just a little bit before Christmas, before the last, um, or just as the last shutdown was uh, being imposed, was saying, you know, you don't need to go to the gym, go outside and get get healthy. So mm-hmm. like, well, all right. I mean, it, I'll give you credit for telling people to stay physically active, but let's mm-hmm. not just outright rule out going to the gym either, even though that is the, the, the message that you're giving yeah. in closing everybody down. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he too was, was missing the opportunity to say, all right, well, you know, gyms do have their place. They, they definitely have a role to play here. Mm -hmm. And physical fitness is absolutely related to the, uh, not just the mortality rate, but the instances of complications related to COVID, Mm -hmm. um, hospitalizations due to COVID, which was the principal focus of the, the study published by the Mayo Clinic. Um, you know, these are all, data metrics that I think governments around the world and uh, again anybody that pay is footing the bill for healthcare should be looking at these uh, studies yeah, for, for sure for sure um, and maybe it's maybe it's like they're the ones that are going to be paying for it yeah exactly and, and maybe well I mean you know our taxes pay for it so it's really yeah. up at the end of the day but but I mean true but they're they're going to know what the bill is before we do <laughs> yeah no it's true <laughs> yeah that's right that's right um, but you know maybe it comes down to you know uh, to having a seat at the table, like we talked to, talked about before, you know, it, it, yeah. if if the conversation can't be had to begin with, then this information isn't getting to the right people, um, and and I think it just it's just that first step of of listening, uh, yeah. of listening to the stakeholders in the fitness industry uh, who who are in the know of what is possible and what is not. And, you know, uh, and even, even at the level of just knowing what's available is in terms of like virtual programs, like I'd be curious to know how many uh, policymakers, you know, realize like what is available in terms of virtual uh, or online, you know, fitness programming. And if they're really, yeah. you know, if they're really adamant about, uh, about, you know, pushing this pandemic, um, or getting through this pandemic, excuse me, uh, then, you know, we need to take a look at, you know, what are the programs out there that, I mean, you don't even need to know them specifically, just that they exist at all. And then just tell people to go find the one that works for them. Right. There's hundreds of them out there. So, yeah. Yeah. Quite a number of gyms here actually wound up making their, when, especially during our prolonged shutdown in order to ensure that they had a vibrant community um, through through the shutdown, they they wound up making their online programming available for free to everybody. That's great. Um, you know, and and I don't know uh, that a tremendous number of people took them up on it, but there were some for yep. sure. Um, yep. And you know th- that that certainly goes a long way to establishing yourself as looking out for the community first. Yep. Um, and you know that that sort of thing would be great to have promoted at at the policymaker level yeah. now you you've had the opportunity to speak with some policymakers to try to um, educate them on uh, these these different areas how yeah. how has the reception been uh, it's uh, you know there's it's tough a lot of it's through email um, I had the mm. chance to sit down with uh, well, sit down at a computer <laughs> with, uh, with with the office of Lisa McLeod, um, the Minister of, of Sport, Heritage, Industry, and Culture Industries, and um, and you know a lot of it is is just is just about education, just getting on their radar. Um, a lot of them are receptive to the ideas that we have, but there's you know their their jobs are entirely dictated by um, a public opinion. Right. And so they need to, they need to basically take a, you know, a bird's eye view of absolutely everything, uh, and, and then make their, their decisions from there. Um, you know, not just, you got to realize that they're, they're trying to keep their job as, as well as, you know, make the right decisions, uh, whether, you know, those decisions to, to keep their job end up being like the right or the wrong ones, you know, who, yeah. who knows, I guess that's politics, but, um, 
we're just, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing my best to try to talk to as many of them as possible that potentially have influence over, over this kind of thing. And, you know, it'd be, I've talked to, um, through email, a few, uh, at the municipal level across Ontario, a couple at the provincial level. And there's, there's a lot of them that are on the same pages as, as sort of we are, and they, they value fitness and they, they understand the difficulties that, that gyms are going through and not just gyms, mm-hmm. but all, all small businesses. And, um, so it's just about, uh, for me right now, personally, it's just about, you know, trying to conduct my regular, you know, day-to-day activities and, and trying to get through the right people slowly, slowly, but surely it's not, uh, it's nothing really fast paced, you know, like we can't, Mm. you talk to, you talk to these, these policymakers and they never are going to give you answers right away. And so the goal is to more or less work with them over a, a longer period of time and to just continue to educate them on what it, what it is that, it, that is possible uh, within the industry. And, and hopefully small changes can be made to sort of move forward over time. Well, and I mean, you know, in the conversations that you have with them, um, you know, I'm sure it, it at least keeps the, the temperature warm um, to the messaging that you're giving them and the data takes a little while to catch up, you know, so certainly the, uh, the Mayo study that, that, um, really only just got published, um, you know, that, that it wouldn't have been possible to rely on data like that six months ago. So, you know, it, it does take time for them to be able to conduct these studies and, and identify statistically relevant patterns that they can then hold up and say, okay, well, here's what we can learn from these different circumstances and what's been seen in one jurisdiction versus another. Yeah. Is it, is it transferable or, or, um, are there, you know, local or, or other specific anomalies that mean that we can't rely on that data? Um, you know, exactly. you've seen, there was another study that I remember morning chalk up pointed to that, um, was really just about contact tracing and, um, the, the percentage of COVID infections, uh, that were traced back to a gym setting, as opposed to the myriad of other, uh, settings that people are going to on a regular basis. And the, the gym setting was incredibly small compared to a variety of other businesses that are considered, um, uh, you know, much, much more essential, but they're also much more contact rich, um, because of the nature of those types of businesses. Yeah. Um, but again, it takes time for that data to, to come to the forefront. And then of course you, the politicians and the public policymakers are playing catch up, just being made aware of the data that that's available. Nope. I think the thing that's been most frustrating is that they're, they are in a position as leaders, not just to set policy, but in the process, educate the public so that they don't feel pressure to uh, not make a decision because the public doesn't know enough to feel one way or the other about a particular problem. Right. And I think that's, that's where I think a little bit of bravery on the part of uh, public policymakers really has to be uh, laid down. I mean, they, they really have to decide for themselves that they're in a position of influence and leadership and leadership sometimes would mean making decisions that are unpopular, but they can also make decisions that help inform the public about what is safe and what isn't. And I feel like they've been doing a decent job on safe versus what isn't um, in you know, the everyday environment that everyone is exposed to. Mm -hmm. And now they really have to start focusing on, all right, what are all the other more specialized environments that not everyone um, participates in, but still benefit from greatly and contributes to how their daily life goes? Yeah. I mean, even, even in that situation, some of it's been confusing. Like the, you know, we're not asking anyone to be perfect or anything, but um, I mean, the data that, they're relying on to make the decisions in the first place is all new data, right? Yeah. Like it's all like this coronavirus didn't exist last, you know, uh, this yep. time last year. And then, I mean, uh, well actually no, the first, the first case in Canada was actually like yesterday, I think, uh, right. last year. But, um, but you know what I'm trying to say? Like yeah. all this data about coronavirus, it's all new data. Yeah. And so the, the decisions that they're making are based off this, this new data and so what you're saying makes sense. And in a scenario where you had tons of accrued data from, you know, years and years and years of experience, like that would make total sense that 
this one paper comes out or this little bit of data comes out about gyms and then you're going to wait till a little bit more accumulates but yeah. but every decision that they've they've made has been off of just brand new data right they're trying to follow the trends and and, do, and use their uh, best judgment to to push everything in the right direction um or at least they say they are but it unless there's stuff that I'm not seeing and there's stuff they're not making public, like, mm. which is, you know, entirely possible. And, and, you know, the whole contact tracing situation is, is a, is a complete mess. So, you know, maybe there's a, maybe there's more, uh, maybe there's more spread in gyms than we think, but the contact tracing just isn't picking it up or whatever, but it's uh, the, you know, the communication on that front hasn't been, you know, super clear in, in my eyes. And so, yeah, it's it can be frustrating at times, but uh, you know, for me, until I, until someone tells me no, like no, you're wrong. The data is actually this. <laughs> like I'm just gonna, I mean, yeah. I'm gonna continue down this road, right? Because I'm not seeing anything that points that suggests that a gyms aren't safe. You know, like right. I'm everything that all the data out there says that they are pretty darn safe. Um, like you know, in like in New York, they they conducted that that massive contact tracing study and i think gyms came out as like you know it was like point, point zero, zero 06 or something yeah like point yeah, zero six percent of community transmissions happen in gyms you know yeah um and i don't know what covid protocol safety protocols are doing in the gyms but i can only assume it's something similar to ontario probably um, yeah and so you know it just it just it, it kind of adds up to uh, in my eyes to you sort of keep pushing for this cause and yeah. um you know but keeping i always keeping that ten thousand foot view right like you know is there are there things that that i don't know I, you know we're in a lockdown situation right now obviously we want to we want to be mindful of the fact that not even schools are open right now and and we want to do everything we can to keep keep the community safe and so you know, you know it comes back to just having that conversation like is when we do decide to reopen you know what when are gyms supposed to be reopening compared to other businesses and and so on and so forth or mm. is there is there going to be a premium put on health and fitness in sort of in sort of the next round of 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 reopening and and the messaging behind that and stuff so yeah yeah i mean yeah t- to your point i mean the the data is pretty new they don't have uh you know generational data to rely upon either i mean the last time a pandemic of this kind of scope um, actually hit was over a hundred years ago. So, yeah. you know, there, there's, there's no way and the data metrics would not be in any way, shape or reliable. They don't even know definitively how many people died from, uh, from Spanish flu. So, you know, s- suddenly we're in this situation where they're having to make the rules up as they go because, and they're doing the very best that they can with the information that they have available. And, throw in the fact that there's new variables that are being introduced all the time, you know, new variants of the virus that are therefore that are more transmissible, um, whether they're more uh, virulent or not, whether they do more damage to the body or not, they just don't know. There's, there's a lot of moving parts that Mm -hmm. they're trying to balance. For sure. Um, And so, you know, I I think more than anything, it's, it's important that, you know, reasonable, um, reasonable voices. We can't say completely unbiased voices. We certainly have a a bias towards the fitness industry, but we're also looking at it as uh, members of the community and and looking for opportunities the same way as we were before the pandemic to try to help people get fitter and healthier and and live better lives. Um, And so that, that goal, that objective doesn't wind up changing. And in fact, it, it, under the current circumstances, it might just help move the needle even further with this awareness that COVID might drive. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Well, hopefully you're able to continue to, um, continue on your, your crusade to (laughs) to get an, get an audience and help, um, you know, educate one public policymaker at a time. Um, you know, I, I think it, it's, it's certainly an uphill battle because, you know, these are, these are people, nobody's a robot. Um, you know, they all have, uh, a lot of other factors to try to weigh. Um, and so, you know, I think it'll take time to, um, educate and sway opinion and for the data to support, um, what we're 
hopefully going to be able to convince people to, to take a serious look at. Um, are there, are there, uh, you know, next steps, uh, from your perspective that you're planning on taking on that front or are you pausing for the moment to just kill it in the open? Uh, good, uh, <laughs> that's a, maybe a little bit of both, actually. Maybe a little bit of both. But the, the open is cre- creeping up a little bit. I might mm, have no to, kidding. Uh, yeah, I might have to take a little bit of a pause for that. But uh, but no, like I said, you know, it's a slow it's a slow creeping sort of situation. Um, and so, you know, I put a bit of a, a bit of time in it into it here and there, and it's it's a lot about uh, networking and getting in touch with the right people to just try to push, like you said, a collective effort. Uh, a collective effort to, uh, in terms of messaging for that sort of pro health and, uh, and fitness uh, in light of this pandemic. And um, so in terms of the next steps, you know, at, it, back in January, in, sorry, no, it was November. In November, I, uh, I sent a letter to policymakers, which sort of kicked this whole thing off. And mm-hmm. for me, the, the sort of next step is, is going to be to revamp that that letter a little bit and and again timing is timing is is sort of everything here like you know I, schools realistically like schools need to open in Ontario for mm-hmm. you know really anything anyone to listen at the policy level to any other kind of business right like schools are going to be the priority and they should be the priority and so you know whether or not they know that um the conversation we're going to have is going to be one where it's, you know, very reasonable. If you come banging on a, on a door, they're just not going to want to be disturbed at this point. So I think, you know, Mm -hmm. just putting a little bit of a pause in terms of this provincial, uh, provincially, this, this stuff in Ontario, it might be needed, but uh, Mm -hmm. you know, right now uh, the education part is huge. And so um my wife and I right now are just are just starting to accumulate some of the some of the data that just shows that that gyms are safe and that um, and that uh, we can potentially open safely in the future uh, with you know more COVID protocols and what is the data that supports some of the protocols that that we would like to see you know implemented uh, to increase safety in light of maybe like you know who knows a fourth wave a, a fifth wave like all this stuff right mm. um, and then also a lot of the data like the Mayo Clinic article that we were just just talking about that shows how important health and fitness is in in keeping the community healthy right not just not just in in preventing chronic disease but even increasing uh, increasing uh, uh, sorry, improving a robust like immune system, right? Increasing the right, function yeah. of the immune system. Like there's lots of studies that show um, that moderate intensity exercise really, really increases that that immune system. And so, having some perspective there, and and if you can uh, if you can accumulate sort of you know all this data into one place and and manage to to present it, then maybe maybe it'll be packaged well enough that someone will, will listen, uh, you know, who has control over, over some policy somewhere or, or, and whatnot. So mm-hmm. I think the first step is just, is just accumulating that stuff. And, uh, and then, you know, the next step from there, we'll see, but yeah, the maybe, maybe by the time I get it all together, the open will hit and it'll just be like open time for a few weeks. And then... <laughs> <laughs> well, it might serve as a necessary distraction. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Have you, have you thought about reaching out to people at the federal level as opposed to, um, just limiting yourself to the, to the scope of the Ontario? No, uh, I have for sure. Yeah, I've, t- yeah. I've, I've, I've been in touch with a few MPs and most of them defer the, defer our questions and and concerns to uh those in charge at the the provincial level so uh, so i've i've sort of decided that you know i was i was for a period of time i was trying to really um i was really poking and prodding the the city councillors and the the mps at the federal level but um they all seem to just defer to the the provincial, uh, the provincial. Well, that is, that is certainly one of the challenges. I mean, even yeah. though, um, you know, even though the coffers are at the federal level, um, it's r- public policy and, and, um, jurisdiction is yeah. really with the provinces, both on education and on healthcare. So yeah, exa- exactly. I, I can understand why they make that choice. Um, for sure, for sure. But you know, it, it's nice when the, the leadership voice at the federal level, um, at least agrees in principle with you. So no, uh, sure. I, I would encu- I would encourage you to to 
keep harping on them a little bit, even if they're even if they're saying that their counterparts at the provincial level are the people that you really need to talk to. I'm sure they're having an awareness of what you're doing probably doesn't hurt. No, definitely. And and I think I agree with you there. Like, you know, at different stages during this this whole thing, the goal has you know, it's, it's shifted slightly from, from left to right and, you know, back to left, just depending on sort of where we're at with this, this pandemic. Like I said, it's, Mm. it's such a, it's such a a sensitive subject and, and, you know, you, you definitely, it can be a little bit, um, you know, some of the, some of the topics were, were really uh, criticized if you ever brought up that you wanted to be open, you know, during a lockdown at the beginning of this pandemic, people would just completely tear you apart because, you know, they thought that it meant that you wanted people to die and all this stuff. Right. So right. some of the, the topics, they, they were <laughs> viewed in that light at, at first. And so being careful with sort of how you present it is important and letting people know sort of leading with the conversation, like, you know, Hey, we're on board with keeping people safe. We really want to, to keep the community healthy. And, and yeah. I think that, uh, like you said, hopefully trying to get some of the messaging at the federal level to, to echo some of that would be yeah. in, from the, from the fitness perspective side of things. Um, that would be huge if that could, that could happen. So yeah, maybe I'll poke and prod a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Well, I wish you all the all the luck in the world because obviously, you know, not only are the the CrossFit gyms around the rest of the country um, watching in um, real keen interest um, the success or, or or progress that you're able to make, even if you're only moving the needle a, a small little piece at a time, it's moving. Um, you know, and it, and it takes um, you know someone like you in a leadership position, um, in a position of influence to be able to drive that message home to the people that ultimately make these decisions that affect so many hundreds of thousands of people all around the country. Um, so, you know, I, I think, uh, myself and, and other gym members and certainly the people that listen to my podcast will be, um, will be keenly watching to see what else happens, what, uh, what more, um, can happen, um, from within, from within the industry, and hopefully, um, start to really see uh, um, some unity um, in what's happening in gym environments around the country, um, regardless of jurisdiction. Because um, I, I think it's it's just too important to just not have a voice on that stage. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I appreciate it. I'm I'm, I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that it's you know the message is, is getting noticed, and I'm glad that I can uh, you know leverage what you know, what small platform I have to try to try to make that happen and, and try to speak, um, you know, on behalf of, of some of these gym owners who, who have similar, similar messaging and, and thought processes. And, um, yeah, I mean, you know, there's a, I'll continue on and, and hopefully, I mean, any, we, I need all the help I can get. Right. And I think we all, we all do. So I would encourage anyone who, who, uh, who wants to, get involved to just, you know, it starts with just a letter, like just send a letter to your, your local policy maker, like your MPP and, and, yeah. or even your MP or your city councilor, like get in touch with those, those people and, and just start a relationship with them. Right. And, and, um, you know, over time, maybe there's something that's going to flourish and you're going to be able to, to speak your mind and, and get some opinions in and potentially make some, some positive change there. And, uh, it can be frustrating because it's such a slow process, right? Like we just, you know, and and n- not only that, but the pandemic is draining, you know, <laughs> like you're, yeah, you're, yeah. Trying to, you're trying to balance everything. And, and you yeah. know, the last thing that you want to do is go out and start and start this, like this fight with, with people. And, but I think that that's sort of the wrong way to look at it is it's not, you know, it's not a fight. It's a, it's a conversation that, that needs to be had. And just some of those small steps in the right direction are, are really uh, in terms of if, for the long game, right? Think of it in terms of the long game. Like if you, yeah. if you just send these letters now and you just, you know, you, tr- you try to get in touch and you start to have these conversations with the people um, that, that can affect these policy changes, then over time or even post pandemic, right? Like if, if, if no changes directly COVID related, happen within 2021 maybe by the end of 2021 we'll all be vaccinated (laughs) we you know fingers crossed the pandemic will be will be gone uh and 
you'll have this relationship built with some of these individuals where maybe you can affect some positive change in the fitness industry and your communities, et cetera. So there's, yeah. a, in, in my eyes, it's a, it's sort of a win-win and, and, you know, uh, you know, keeping things in perspective and making sure you're, you're always respectful of, of, uh, of where everyone's coming from in terms of their opinion and, and why they're making, uh, making decisions. It, it always helps to, to sort of push the needle in the right direction. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a game of increments, much like what we do every day in the gym. That's exactly it. Exactly. Thanks, Pete. I really appreciate it. John, thanks for having me, man. That was a really fun conversation. All right. Cheers. Good luck. Thanks. Good luck in the open. <laughs> thanks. I'll see you on the leaderboard. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and next time you're in Halifax for, uh, for a seminar, uh, look me up. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll do a workout together and I'll, you'll get to watch me finish cause you'll be long since done. <laughs> I, I doubt it. I think you give yourself a little more credit. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Hey, cheers, man. That's time for this episode. All that's left is the M wrap up. Are gyms essential businesses or luxuries that can be set aside during the current pandemic? What best practice protocols can be shared among gyms to make them as safe as possible for their members? What differences are there between different styles of fitness facilities that need to be considered rather than treating them as an all or nothing proposition? It's clear from Pete's activism on this front that he's not just looking to protect his own business. As a co-owner of a successful CrossFit gym in Ottawa, he's clearly got skin in the game. But he's never argued blanketly that gyms should remain open. As we discussed, he's clear that safety comes first. His argument remains that there's a safe way for fitness facilities to be open and at the same time do tremendous good for the population they serve. And if health policy leaders take even a small step in that direction, recognizing what a positive impact just the pursuit of fitness can have on people's physical and emotional well-being, then the activism could well save lives. And not just during the current pandemic. The hope is for a long-term shift of perception, to realize what fitness really is, an indispensable armor in our battle with sickness, a vital part of healthcare. Follow Pete's activism and show some love by following him on Instagram and Twitter. His handle on Instagram is at PeteShaw4, And on Twitter, he's Pete Shaw 444. Obviously, many more Pete Shaws on Twitter. And check out the episode's show notes for links and some uh, links to some of the studies that we mentioned in our chat. That's it for this episode. If you liked it, please share it. Maybe even drop me an email at podcast at boxjumper.ca. Like I said in the intro, please follow me on social media. The handle is at boxjumper over four zero on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you could subscribe on your favorite podcasting app. And finally, add your email to the BoxJumper mailing list by visiting BoxJumper.ca. Thanks for listening. I finally shook off the rust. Another episode of the BoxJumper podcast is already lined up. Until then, stay healthy, wad happy, and wad often. <laughs>